Father God, we come before you. We thank you for your word, your loving kindness, your mercy that's new every morning. And Lord, they're, uh, they're on the move. They want to get the world organized from an information point of view. They want to control who can travel where, when, and what. These things, Lord, you remind us of in your book of Revelation. That there's a day coming when, when they pull the rug out from under you, you can't buy or sell. We're watching, Lord, more and more centralization of data, governance, health response, emergency responses, so many things. And personally, Lord, I'm so grateful that you have warned us about these things before they come to pass. So rather than getting all upset, Lord, we simply continue to look up because our Redeemer and our redemption is near. So, Lord, we ask that you would bless this time. And as we get into chapter 12, Lord, may chapter 12 get into our walk with you. And we thank you for your faithfulness in Jesus' name. Amen. Romans, so here we go. For of him, verse 36, chapter 11, and through him and to him are all things. And we tested that last week, creation. It's of God. It was worked through the Son of God. And ultimately, he desired fellowship with us. It's to him, and he's redeemed us back to himself. Same thing with, you know, let's go with the one that people love to argue, election. Election is of God. He calls. It's to God. He draws, it's through him. He draws you through the Spirit. And when you receive him, it brings you to him. This is over and over, this wonderful idea of even Israel, of him. It was done through him and to him. These things are all. To whom be glory forever and ever. Amen to the Lord. His working in the world and in the lives of people. So chapter 12. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, willing to forgive sinners, all have sinned, willing to redeem us from our sins, these wonderful truths, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. <laughs> Which is easier? To be a dead sacrifice one time, or to be a living sacrifice every day. It starts making sense, doesn't it? Like, yeah, you know, once and done, as opposed to daily laying down our lives. Living sacrifice. On the day of Pentecost, there was a mighty rushing wind, yes? The room was filled with this rushing wind sound, yes? What appeared above the heads of the people? What did they become? living sacrifices, the fire of God upon them, a living sacrifice. To be a living sacrifice, the idea is that you're surrendering your life daily to the Lord. Okay, Lord, what would you have me to do? And, and here I am, I surrender, and I want to live in a way that's pleasing to you. So Paul has been through quite a lot of doctrinal instruction there to the church, but now he's really getting down to the idea of how do we walk out these truths that we've learned? So I beseech you by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is because he's redeemed you, the word is logikos in the Greek. What's that sound like? Logical or reasonable service, serving the Lord, surrendering our lives to him. There's a lot to talk about in looking at this, but just for fun, turn to Ephesians chapter 4. What does it mean to start being a living sacrifice? Ephesians 4 says to us, verse 17, I say therefore, and I testify in the Lord, that you henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having their understanding darkened, this is the lost, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness or wanton living to work all uncleanness with greediness, but ye who believe you have not so learned Christ, if so be that you have heard him and have been taught him <clears throat> by him as the truth is in Jesus. What are we to do? That you put off concerning the former conversation or manner of living, the old man. He's going to describe that to us in a verse or two. Which is corrupt through deceitful lust. That person that you were when you were lost before you met Jesus. The old man, the old woman. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. How do you do that? 
give you hints in your hand. And that you put on the new man, which after God has created in righteousness and true holiness. Well, can you make that more practical? Sure, verse 25. Wherefore, put away lying. That was the behavior of who? The old man or woman. Here's the difference when you've been renewed. But speak every man the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be ye angry. That was the old man or woman. And sin not. There is a righteous anger. The problem is it's hard to find. Usually we just have unrighteous anger. But there is an anger to have where you sin not. Nor let the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. Watch out for anger. It's a play yard for him. Let him that stole. Klepto is the word in the Greek, which sounds like kleptomaniac. Let him that stole, that's the old man, steal no more. But rather let him labor, working with his hands the things which, is, or which are good, that he may have to give to him that needs. So you're not only not stealing, you're working and giving to others. Again, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. That was the old man. It's amazing the words you used as noun, verbs, modifiers, adjectives, instead of using proper words. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. But that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And the warning, grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Again, the old man, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, outcry, shouting, evil speaking, be put away from you with all malice. And here's what happens when you renew your mind. Be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. There's been some interesting studies that they've been able to do as our technology catches up to what God has created. We've done a series in the past called the Conqueror Series. How many have heard of it? It's a series trying to help people, men and women, because unfortunately it's, it's growing in both demographics, but get out of issues with pornography and other things. And part of what they've done, they brought in the, the researchers and neurological things that are going on within the brain. They've studied the patterns of addiction, be they drug use or other issues or alcohol or pornography. And the way it's supposed to work normally with your brain is you have desire, but it should go through your frontal cortex, which overrules and is the judge and helps you to make good decisions. And then that should overrule or kind of govern what's happening. And then you go to your, your limbic system, your reward system, the nucleus accumbens, a whole bunch of words you'll never remember. So what's the point? <laughs> so it should work kind of like this. Aha. Mm, no, you don't. All right. I'll put that idea away. But when you get into an addiction, you start getting this direct connect between the desire and the reward cycle of your brain or the reward center, and it starts snowballing. And how many understand the idea of neurons in your brain? There are these things that are connecting, basically passing along information back and forth. And you know, we talk about having muscle memory, for example, for those who like to pump you up, right? They have muscle memory and all that, and they work things out. And you know, if you're a target shooter, you get it and all that. But the idea is when you, when you reinforce certain behaviors, the neurological path that you make for that grows stronger in a sense, making it very simple. But the same thing can go on with the addiction reward cycle to where the drive and desire for the reward, the dopamine, the different chemicals in your brain that get released and the desire for this fulfillment can become so strong it will basically bypass your frontal cortex, your reasoning, your logic, and just does this direct connect where you are just driven to get to whatever it is that is bringing you that pleasure reward to that part of the center of your brain. And so they've done these studies and they've realized that people are getting caught up in this. And I find it helpful because I don't know about you, but once you know how you're getting ripped off, it's a lot easier to figure out how not to, true? Yeah. Once you know how, like the guy who keeps coming and siphoning your gas tank, how he's getting into it, then you know how to lock the gas tank, right? So once you can figure out where things are going wrong, then you can begin to figure out a way to apply the solution. So in their research, they show how that, for example, let's go with men caught up in pornography, this reward cycle gets so reinforced that it gets to where they say, I, I can't help myself. I'm just driven to it. I, can't, I go half an hour and I you know, get crazy or whatever. Sadly, they're owned by it. In fact, what they really are is they are in bondage to it. You say, well, what do you do? Well, there's a couple of components, and that is you have to get away from the behavior. So you need brothers or sisters in Christ to help hold you accountable, help you kind of like listen and find other avenues of things to do other than going straight to that thing that's been driving you. But what they found in time with the research is as you get things right, get a right set of pattern and help around you to get away from the behavior, you will eventually, what had been a four-lane paved highway of that reward cycle connection, 
with forsaking and turning away from these things, it will eventually lose its grip, its power, and essentially think of a path that overgrows again and gets down to a little path. It doesn't mean that temptation won't come, but when it comes, now it's not so overwhelming, that connection so strong that it grabs you and takes you, that now when the temptation comes, you're able by these things you put in place, especially memorizing scripture, having people around who can help you and support you, you can say, you know what, it's written. You shall not, for example, lust after a woman, desire in your heart because it's already adultery. And suddenly the word of God is delivering you from what used to own you all the time. Does this all make sense? Okay, and you're thinking, what does this have to do with our study tonight? Because there's two parts to it. One, you've got to get away from the behavior. And two, you've got to take your mind and put it to more useful things. So the first part of opening that door to getting free of this reward cycle that takes over with addiction is presenting your body a living sacrifice. That if I want to be pleasing to Jesus, and I'm engaged in a behavior that his word makes very clear it's wrong, whether it's, you know, you're into pornography or sexual sin, whether it's heterosexual, homosexual, whatever kind of sexual, whatever kind of sin you're in outside of marriage, whatever the flavor, these things that are owning you, step one is you've got to surrender. Then, interestingly enough, as you surrender and you take the word of God and work it into your heart, that word of God begins to bring that witness of the spirit against those temptations and those desires, which helps you to be able to, by the grace of God, to go to prayer. God, help me. Help me to take this thought captive. 2 Corinthians 10, 5. Help me to set my mind on things above. Philippians 4, 8. Help me to, and God will begin to help you as you lean on his word and walk in simple obedience best you can. God will begin to help you get away from these behaviors. And now what we're finding, thanks to this new you know, research that they're doing and MRI scans and everything else, that as you put these things in place, that Paul's exhorting the church to do. You start literally renewing your mind. So it's a very simple thing. Put off the old man, these behaviors. You've got to turn away from them, and that's part of making your body a living sacrifice. You've got to renew your mind. That only comes from the word of God in prayer. And then you've got to start putting on the new man. Well, what's the new man? It's here in the word. You who stole, steal no more, labor with your hands, give to others. It's more blessed to give than to receive. Find the secret of serving God. And as people do that, the change begins to come. So when I started seeing their research and the things they put out, number one, thank you very much for showing us neurochemically how we're getting duped. Praise God, because now we can help people see why they need to do what they need to do. Two, you prove the scripture. And the scripture didn't say you need to know what the nucleus accumbens is. And the other things, are, you're like, what is that? How do I spell it? It just said, renew your mind. Put off the old man, renew your mind, put on the new man, which, by the way, you learn by renewing your mind, and you know, you'll be suddenly set free. And suddenly what used to own you, yeah, it's always out there, like, uh -huh, I see you, but no thank you, because I know where you've taken me before. And you're now a new creature in Christ. So this idea of putting off and putting on, it's only possible through faith in Christ and surrendering to his spirit. Look at Galatians, go left from Ephesians, look at Galatians 5, uh, five yeah, one five. Here we can look at old man versus new man once again. And the difference between the two is walking in the spirit. And you learn how to walk in the spirit by reading the word and simply obeying him. He said, this I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. I know this is going to be rocket science too and you've never heard it before. But your flesh lusts against your spirit. How many of you are like, I had no idea. <laughs> and the spirit lusts or desires to have correction or dominion over the flesh. These are contrary, yes they are, the one to another, so that you cannot do the things that you would. Gee, it feels like we're back in Romans again. But if you be led of the Spirit of God, you're not under the law. Now the works, and boy it does take effort, of the flesh are obvious or manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, interesting sexual sins first on the list, lasciviousness, which is basically shameless, unrestrained behavior. Imagine a society with that, <laughs> fools. Idolatry, witchcraft, sorcery, or pharmakia, which we get pharmacy. Hatred, variations, emulations, or jealousies. Wrath, again, just, just losing it. Outcries and fits. Strife, seditions, factionalism, heresies, envying, murders, drunkenness, revelings, drunken parties, basically, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in the time past, or in time past, that they which do such things, the ideas continually, shall not inherit the kingdom of God. 
but a renewed mind. The fruit of the Spirit is, first item up for bids, love. You never run into someone who says, would, would you stop loving me? Stop. <laughs> love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, it's alphabetical if you're trying to remember it, faith, meekness, temperance, such there, against such there is no law. Those are they that are Christ have crucified the flesh. Hmm, what's that putting off? The old man. With the affections and lusts, which we all are aware of, and if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. That's putting on the new man. So let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. Let's be new. So back to, you've only gotten one verse. You know, you're right. Let's get back to Romans. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. It's a daily thing. And it's a thing to show honor to the one who paid for our sins. A living sacrifice, you ought to be holy acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service considering he laid down his life to pay for you and for me. Be not conformed, that is shisimadzizo. You try it. Yeah, gunzintait. To be fashioned. Be not conformed to this world. That's literally aeon, that's age. But be metamorphuo, transformed by the renewing of your mind. And that's when you get into the word of God. That's how you renew your mind. And this is why Satan doesn't want you to read a Bible. You, you've been a great, I got, I got 20 minutes, I can sit down and read my Bible. And you open it up and zzz, zzz, or the dog like runs out the door or whatever. You know, it's, it's just is amazing. Same thing, you go to prayer and everything starts happening. Because he doesn't want you to renew your mind. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It comes from the word of God. It comes from prayer and fellowship can help as well. That you may prove, test or show, what is that good? That's agathos in the Greek. That's good. Acceptable. That's everestos. That's well-pleasing. And perfect. That's teleos or final or complete. What is that good and well-pleasing and perfect or complete will of God? Do you see, if you know your Bible... It's really easy to make judgment calls on a lot of things in this world. But if you don't know your Bible, then, you know, and this happens. People get saved, still have some, should we say, baggage in their life. Is that a nice way to say it? Mm -hmm. And they start reading the Bible and they're like, uh, uh, I shouldn't be doing that. but I like doing that. But it doesn't please God. And I love God more than that. So I guess it's time to change. And as they take that step in obedience, God will help them. This idea of renewing your mind, living sacrifice, daily you choose. And sometimes moment by moment you choose who's on the throne of your heart, you or Jesus? Who's Lord of your life, you or him? He paid for you, which means technically he is. He bought you. He owns us. Praise God. He's a great one to serve, and he's going to reward us one day. But if you renew your mind and you're in the word, then it's real easy to figure out, is this good in God's sight? Is this something that God would be pleased with? And is this something that's complete before him or teleos, perfect in the will of God? It gets easier and easier to pray the more you know the word of God because it tells you how to pray. But we should keep moving. For I say, I say, dear chap, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Now, thank goodness this generation isn't obsessed with how they look or what they're doing or what they post. Not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly. What did God make man from? The dust. Long ago, when I was going through this text, it finally hit me because, you know, they do it all the time. Hollywood always creates these events that are supposed to be important that everybody's supposed to tune into where they all just do this to each other and then give a bunch of little trophies and move on to the next year. And the big moment is always when everybody's on the red carpet. You know, and then they have like a little sign wherever with the, whatever the event is and they all like... 
right? They do the whole poses and all that and click, 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 whatever they do nowadays. And you sit there and you watch and, and really what you have is just extremely well-dressed dirt <laughs> with spirit in it. You know, if you've got a bunch of vacuum bags, cut them open and put them all over the carpet, they wouldn't be like, <laughs> or dirt. You know, right now, God could require the breath in your mouth. And you're done. Well, you're going to have to prove that. Okay, fine. Daniel 5, drunken feast. Belshazzar the king. They're holding the cups of gold, silver, and other things. They're praising the gods of wood, stone, gold, silver. He's there with his concubines, his lords. It's about a thousand of them. It's a drunken feast. It's complete debauchery. And then this hand comes out suddenly from the wall near the lampstand. Some argue it's the actual lampstand. We've got to wait till heaven. And writes, Mene, Mene, Tekel, you farson. Wade, Wade found wanting of breaches upon you. Daniel gets called in and he says, the God whose cup you're holding in your hand, he's holding your breath in his. And you've been weighed, found wanting, and judged. And that night, Babylon was sacked by Cyrus, diverting the river, going in underneath, and they didn't even realize the city was taken by the time that it was done. It's amazing how quickly God can move. So I say through the grace given unto me to every man and every woman that's among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. In fact, when you want to think something about yourself, remember Jesus. But to think soberly, according as God has dealt, that's merizo coming from meros, a share or a part, God has divided to everyone a part or a share, the measure of faith. God has given to every one of you, if you're here and you believe, God has given to you the measure of faith. What do you mean? For it's by grace, through faith, and that, not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. You've been saved, not of works, lest any man should boast. So God draws us. God gives us this ability to turn to him. It's, it's really literally all God. So what do we have to boast of? Well, I believe before you did. Well, I believe more seriously than you did. God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body. How many of you brought your appendix tonight? Yes. How many are missing it? There's always a few. For as we have many members in one body, all the members have not the same office. You have an appendix and you have a pancreas. They're similar, close in location, very different, different functions. You have a thorax and you have a thyroid. Close in location, very different functions. It's amazing all the things in your body. You don't even think about it. How many of you are grateful that your gallbladder is working today? Some of you don't have one. You know, it's an interesting thing that God uses to talk about the church. He calls it the body of Christ. When you believed in Jesus, what did Jesus promise he would give to you? The Holy Spirit. And where would he be? In you. And that was the promise that was made. Jeremiah 31, there'll be a new covenant. Ezekiel 36, I will write my law on their inward parts by my spirit, saith the Lord, and I will forgive their sins. He gives us the Holy Spirit. So the spirit of God living in you is that work that God will do to convict you, yes, but also to affirm you as you put off the old man, walk in the newness of life. It's through the spirit you can renew your mind because he unlocks it to you. And then it gets to be an interesting thing when you think about it. He living in us by his spirit, we are his body and we're all around the world and he uses the body of Christ to reach all around the world people who are in darkness to come to the love and the knowledge of God. And he uses, it's, it's an interesting way to do it, but he's reaching the world through one changed person at a time. If you would actually share with someone what God's done in your life, ask him the question, why not, hey, if you die, where are you going to go today? And get into that discussion. You may plant, you may water, you may harvest, or you may just drag a little edge over that hard, hard heart that the next guy finally is able to get a little seed into that heart that eventually comes to salvation. You are the outreaching and outworking of God in this world. You're his body, and he expresses himself and interacts with this world through his body, the church. Now, if your body starts going to war against itself, you got problems, don't you? But sadly, Satan loves to get in and get the body fighting itself instead of being a light to the nations. You take that analogy and consider it. It's amazing how simple, but yet how profound. We have many members in one body. 
And all members have not the same office. Quite a few different functions happening right now as you sit there. You're listening, you're breathing, your heart's moving, you're digesting dinner, I wish you had, and all that. So we, the church, being many, are one body in Christ and everyone members of one another. And one of the joys of going around and traveling at different times, different mission fields, you'll, or even just, you know, as more of the world coming here in a sense, you meet someone, you can't speak their language, they can't speak your language, but you somehow you find out or discern you both know Jesus. And there's that, there's that sense of joy, like you can see, like, yeah, you know, and you, like you try to talk and like, eh, you know, but, you, but you're like, yeah, yeah, you know, and, all, and, and, it, and there's this fellowship. Why? Because you're part of the same body. Red or yellow, black or white, all are precious in his sight. One body. It shouldn't be fighting itself and divided. So as God has given to every man the measure of faith... We, as many members in one body, are all members, and are, are, are we, as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office. So we, we, the church, being many, are one body in Christ. You know, heaven's going to be really interesting. See how that works? And everyone members of one another. <laughs> I have a private theory that people you don't get along with the church are going to be your next door neighbors in heaven for eternity. I just, I just have this theory that God's like, yeah, we'll fix that. I'm going to work on that one with you in, in Greece. So then, being part of the body, we get this promise. Having then charisma in the Greek, spiritual gifts. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. Whether prophecy, pastor, yeah. I don't have a gift. Turn to 1 Corinthians 12, right turn. There's always, you know, I, I know everybody else has a gift, but... I didn't get a gift. 1 Corinthians 12. Now concerning spiritual gifts, we're going to get to these guys eventually. Corinth is a town that, let's just say, has issues. I would not have you ignorant. You know that you were Gentiles, most of us, carried away under these dumb idols, even as you were led. Wherefore, I give you to understand, so you don't have to be afraid of God's enabling, that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed, even if he's given you a tongue, you don't know what you're saying, don't panic. No man by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed. And that no man can say Jesus is the Lord but by the Holy Spirit. It's a great self-check. Try it. Jesus is the Lord. How are you? Can you do it? If you can't, raise your hand. We'd love to get a hold of you. Jesus is the Lord but by the Spirit. Now there are diversities of gifts but the same Spirit. There are differences of administrations, how they are used, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, how strongly one may use a gift, even though they have the same gift. But it is the same God which worketh all in all. Now to you naysayers, here's your verse. But the manifestation of the Holy Spirit is given to what? Every man to profit with all. You all have at least one spiritual gift. And you can't tell me don't. Peter says the same thing. He's given a measure at every minute. You all have at least one spiritual gift. And of course, the question is, are you using it? Yeah, Lou wants to say, what is it? <laughs> that, that, well, until I feel what I know what the gift is, I'm not going to serve. No. Start serving. Serve somewhere. Serve anywhere. And you will very quickly find out, I am not gifted for that. Okay, then start serving somewhere else. Keep going until eventually, like, wow, I really enjoy this. Guess what? You're gifted for that. Well, it's easy for you because you went to a Bible college and they told you what your gift was. No. It gets easier to discern what God wants to do in you and through you as you spend time renewing your mind. And he begins to lay on your heart a desire and impression of where he wants you to go. And then there's the challenge of actually being obedient and doing it. But he's given the manifestation of the Spirit to every man to profit with all. In fact, he wants to reward you in heaven for it. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of, the word of wisdom, verse 8, 1 Corinthians 12. The word of wisdom. That's knowing how something ought to be done, even though you've never done it before. God give you wisdom is the idea. To another, the word of knowledge. That's knowing something you absolutely positively should not and could not know, and yet you do. How? The Spirit of God gave you a word of knowledge. By the same Spirit. To another, faith. Don't we all have faith? Yes, this is a unique and, and in a sense, 
unusual ability to really put yourself out there for Jesus and trust he's going to show up. Faith, the gift of faith. To another, by the same spirit, faith. To another, the gifts of healing. If you have them, we'd love to know who you are. I'm not kidding. A lot of people are hurting right now. And we pray for them when we see some healed, but would to God we'd see them all healed. To another, the gifts of healing by the same spirit. To another, workings of miracles, unusual dynamic power. To another, prophecy, forth telling God's message to his church in some fashion, prophecy usually for edification, exhortation, and comfort. We learn in chapter 14. To another, discerning of spirits. You sit there and you go, I don't know what chapter and I don't know what verse, but what that guy's teaching is definitely off. That's discernment of spirit. And it shows up in a number of ways that God will give you that. To another, diverse kinds of tongues. Oh, you had to read that. You had to go there. Well, it's here in the chapter. Yeah, but the church has, you know, had arguments. Oh, you mean the church is doing this to itself about it? Maybe they should just renew their mind and read what it says. Diverse kinds of tongues. To another, thank God, the interpretation of tongues. But all these worketh that one and self same spirit, ready, here it comes, dividing to every man severally or according as he will. Question, can God give you the gift of speaking in tongues? Yes. I say yes. Does that mean he will? No. Well, you'll find out eventually if he does. But then he goes on and says this to us. God has, in verse 28, set some in the church. First, apostles. Secondary, prophets. Thirdly, teachers. After that, miracles. Then, gift of healings. Helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Now, here's a rhetorical set of questions. Are all apostles? The answer is no. Everybody good with that? Any swing voters? Second, are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Have all gifts of healing? Do some? Yeah, from time to time. Do all speak with tongues? What is the answer? Well, then why are there denominations that say you're not really spirit-filled unless you speak in tongues? How did they miss this verse? Or you're being mean. No, I'm reading the verse. How did they get so far off in left field that they'll tell you, well, we just, you know, we got to loosen your tongue, brother. When the Bible's clear, God gives it to those he desires. The gift is real. Don't let nonsense keep you from knowing there's a real gift of tongues or prophecy. But it comes when God desires to give it to you. Well, can I ask him for it? Yeah, man, Luke 11, 11. If you fathers being evil know how to give, give good gifts to your children, how much more your father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Well, what if he gives me something strange? No man speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed. He doesn't give counterfeit gifts. He's a good father. He doesn't hand out knockoffs. Why they've gotten this so wrong is beyond me, but you know, we'll get to Corinthians later because that'll just we'll spend, I'll get emails and everything else. And just back to Romans. So we then having many members in one body, all members have not the same office. In fact, even in the same office, you have different strengths of it in administrations. We learned that. So we, verse five, being many, are one body in Christ and every one members of one another. Having then gifts, you all have one. Don't bury it. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. Whether prophecy, again we talked about, let us prophesy according to the measure of faith. You see, forth telling in some fashion what God is going to do, take some, take some faith. And sometimes God may give you a word for an individual. And that's, you're like, ah, oh, yeah, but, but what if it was last night's pizza with anchovies? And it's not, it's not the Lord. Well, what do I do? Well, sometimes I've had simply, listen, I... I feel God's putting this on my heart. I need to share it with you. I may be wrong. But I'd rather share it because God's telling me I better share it than leave it and it could have brought edification, exhortation, or comfort. And I failed to do that. Whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to faith, measure faith. Ministry, that's diaconus, serving. And that happens throughout the building, throughout the week here. We thank God for all that we have. Serving in many ways. Let us wait on our ministry, ministering, being faithful. Or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth. Think Barnabas for a great example, Pericletos. Someone comes alongside Pericleo and helps out. He that exhorts on ex exhortation. He that giveth. Let him do it with simplicity. Some people actually have the gift of giving. And they love to do it quietly and they love to do it so God is honored. It's fun to watch sometimes. 
He that ruleth, and again, the idea is leading or governing, and that's, again, many places within the church where we need people that help oversee things. We call them coordinators, but the idea would be he that ruleth. They have ministries that they oversee, volunteers, and they run with it, and they do amazing jobs with it, and take in directions we never would have thought. They're using their gifts of helping the rule over areas with diligence. He that showeth mercy with cheerfulness, herlot. Hilarotes is the word, hilariously, cheerfulness. These wonderful gifts of God to minister back to the body of Christ. And every one of you has one. So let love be without dissimulation or pretext the idea and the idea of hypocrisy ultimately. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor, that's apostego. To hate, to detest with horror. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. You know, we've been going through the word for a number of years here, and, and it's always surprising to me, and I've seen it slide. It's concerning how much evil the church at times is willing to tolerate. Sometimes people don't realize, you know, I'll be going by and someone's like, oh yeah, I'm watching that series now too, and man, I loved episode whatever, and I'm like, what is the series? And you look up and you're like, wow. Well, I'm not talking around Pastor Chris anymore, man. Forget that. <laughs> or there's been movie series that have come out and you're here like, oh, yeah, we're going to see this. And I, I'm, I'm like, wow. If we become so tolerant of evil, then how are we different than the world? There's a right time to call it out, too. The problem with evil is you see something evil, you see something wicked, and it, it's, there's the shock value first of like, oh, did I, you know, did I just see that? And then there's the curiosity, sadly, that evil often puts in the things that it does. So you're like, what? oh, you know? And then, sadly, often with evil, this promise of fulfillment or whatever, there's, there's, it's, it shocks you, it will draw you in, and it's got its own seductive component to it. It's promising something somehow, some way, whether entertainment or enlightenment or pleasure or whatever it is, and it's lying to you because it doesn't deliver because if it was once and done, they wouldn't have to make any more of it. One would be it. No upgrades needed. But that's the problem with evil. And when you allow yourself to start getting involved with things that are evil or, or entertaining yourself with things that are evil, it begins to desensitize you to the things around you in this world. And look, I'm not saying that, so we just, what do you do at night? We sit on our couch because our pastor told us we have to sit here. <laughs> I'm not one of those preachers like, well, that's the devil. I'm not doing that to you people. But I'll give you a great test. You're sitting there watching. The Lord comes in, sits down next to you. What are you doing now? Hey, Lord, didn't know you, didn't know you had a key. Don't need keys. Oh, yeah, I read that. Just be careful. The church is sadly becoming far too tolerant. Abhor. He says detest, hate that which is evil. Cleave. Hang on to that which is good. Yeah, but good's not entertaining. Oh, come on. Cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectioned. That's philostorgos, not philostooges, philostorgos. Phila, love of, storge, or storgos, family. Love of family. Family, love, and affection. Be kindly affectioned one to another. Because see, if you're a believer, you're in his body. And if you're in his body, then the people around you are your brothers and sisters in Christ. And therefore, the family love of God should be evident among us. Yes, even within families, there are times you have things you got to straighten out or whatever. But that family love of Jesus should be there. And that witness of the family love of Jesus speaks a lot to a world out there that's lost. And so that's why Satan tries to come in and divide the family of Christ. Again, back to doing this to itself. Abhor that which is evil. Be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love. <laughs> Why not? I got a minute. Years ago, uh, our, one of our kids who were with some other children in a, they're children, but they're driving, they're, you know, so they're high school age. It was right around the years, January 4th or whatever. So we were at a friend's house. They're having a party and these kids are coming to it. And, and they're going along and they're in an old like Mercedes turbo diesel or diesel. I don't know if it was a turbo. Anybody ever had a Mercedes diesel or turbo diesel? It goes zero to 60 in about a week. <laughs> but man, once they get rolling, right? They're just, they're just not fast. Over. And so they had come out of our place. They're climbing a hill. They're on a little Conestoga. They're climbing up. And, 
And, uh, and someone in a Land Cruiser blew the stop sign, caught the front of the car, and literally bent the front of the car around to the side. Five kids in it. Just boom. Suddenly we get the phone call, we're at the friend's house, hey, we've been in an accident, so I'm not far away, I get in the car, I drive over, I get there, and, and I, I mean, I kid you not, the front of that car was wiped to the side. The Land Cruiser had a big wedge in the side of it, so she basically just got clipped right in the middle of their car, boom. And, uh, and they're there, and yeah, they got some seatbelt burns and all that, but the, the kids are okay. And that's when we started buying old Mercedes, because number one, if you have an old Mercedes and you need tie rods, ball joints, the transmission service and all that, you go to the dealer and you're like, you, you, want, you want four grand to fix my two grand car? And it goes on Craigslist. And I buy it for 900 bucks. And then I put ball joints in it and tie rods and brakes and all that and do the transmission service and replug its brain and then suddenly it out is driving like a Mercedes. Our current one I paid 995 bucks for. We've had it for, it survived the three little girls. It's down to driver number three. Shh, got a few dents and we'll tell you who. <laughs> We've had two of them total. And they were fine. They walked away. No problem. That's when I realized, hey, these guys build a brick of a car. So they're all okay. Everybody's good. I see over there the, the, um, the lady who had hit them and she's with her daughter. And it's cold. It's January. And obviously she's upset. I came over. Are you Okay. You know, and start talking to her like we're, they're fine. Don't worry about them and all that. And I said, "What do you need?" Because you could tell some. She's like, I, "I don't have my coat. I don't have my purse. Where are they?" Well, they're in the car. Well, they're getting ready to rack everything up and take it away. So I quick go in, jump in the car, find this, find that, find whatever backpack, stuffed animal, bring it out, hand it to them. And as I'm talking, like, "You got anything else? You're okay." Another car drives up. This guy hops out. He kind of goes running by all of us, looks at the car, comes back and starts talking to her. What happened? It's her husband. Ladies, how do you feel? I just, well, as soon as he went by and I realized, like, I think this is her husband. He went straight to the car. I'm like, oh, dude, you just, you just, ooh, it's going to take you months to recover from this one, right? <laughs> and I, you know, I walked away there talking, whatever, and I go back over the kids. And I know some of the officers. And one came up and said, you know, at first, I thought you were her husband. I'm like, no, because because you were concerned about her. And she's the one who hit your kids. Let brotherly love continue. That woman was traumatized. You hit a car full of five kids. It's your fault. Get them just right. It could have been a much different outcome. There are a lot of opportunities throughout your day to be different than this world. You have the love of Christ. And they have nothing. They have upgrades to stuff that's worthless. Let brotherly love continue. It's amazing what happens when you let the love of God Come into your life. And yeah, I get bad days and I get everything. I got all that. But you know what? God wants to work through you even in letting the love of Christ shine through. Be kindly affectioned one to another. With brotherly love and honor. Preferring one another. That's not this generation. They worry about themselves first, sadly. And that's unfortunately nothing new under the sun. They just post it more. The other generations kept it quiet. Wrote it in their diaries. Preferring one another. Not slothful in business. <laughs> I know, I'm on a rant tonight. Um, with my kids, I've said to them, listen, you show up and say, yes, sir, yes, ma'am, when you're working somewhere, right? You, you stay busy. Right now, if the store's empty, there's nothing else to be done. Whatever, you have some homework, okay, fine, that's fine. But otherwise, if you're there and everything, there's things work, I said, you'll blow away your competition. Because your competition, the fellow employees are going, door rings, you know, customer comes in, they're standing at the counter, Have you ever been there? You're like, oh my goodness, what happened to us? Just by working hard. And every single one of them, God's blessed them just because they work hard. We have a little rule in our house. If you borrow something, like somebody's car or whatever, you're working or you're at their place or whatever, leave it better than when you found it. Because that's not being slothful. Leave it better than when you found it. Just like everything Jesus interacted with, he left it better than when he found it. Just a thought. Be not slothful in business, fervent, boiling in the idea, in spirit, serving the Lord. Why? Because you're supposed to be a living sacrifice. That's why. Serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope. Yeah, this world's losing it, and for us, it's just getting closer. Rejoicing in hope. He's coming. 
patient in thlipsis, and that's hupomeno, to be underneath abiding, abiding under affliction or tribulation, thlipsis. Continuing instant in prayer. I don't know how to pray. Just start talking. And God will refine it with time. And the more you read his word, the more you know how to pray. In fact, the more you read his word, the more you know how to pray according to his will. It all rolls together. It's like you're trying to tell us to read our Bible. Yeah. Exactly. Continuing instant in prayer. Constantly in prayer. Lifting up things in your life. Distributing to the necessity of the saints. Helping people in trouble. That's a bold witness. And lately, some tough things going on. You know, yeah, why not? downtown, taking care of my dad, taking him in for a heart, follow-up heart appointment. We've been doing a lot of that lately. Thank God some things are going well. And as I'm there, you know, now, why, why use a human being to pay for bills when you can deal with something automated that doesn't know what it's doing? That's far more efficient. And so it's, you know, spitting it back out, spitting it back out, spitting it, and finally get it, and finally, you know, whatever. And as I'm there, some gal's at the seat behind me on the counter, and, and she's on the phone, and she's working there. And she's talking about, yeah, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to pull it together, but rent's due. And, I, you know, and the, what? And she said, it's, I think it was like 170 or 190 bucks. She's trying to pull that together. Look how much prices have just kept going up. Think about it. You're used to putting $2 gas or whatever in your car, and it goes up to, you know, four and change, and now it's lower because we're borrowing the price of food. How many of you have been in the store? Like, are you kidding me? See, I have a canary in this coal mine. It's called M&M's. I'm like, wow. I've cut back a little. Seriously. Helping one another, especially within the body of Christ, can go a long way. And the needs of the saints may be increasing the more these policies and 31 trillion in debt come home to roost. Distributing to the necessity of the saints given the hospitality. That means having people over in your home. It's a love for strangers. Hebrews warns us, you know, you might entertain angels unaware doing that. Hospitality, it's a good thing. Bless them which persecute you. That doesn't really say that, does it? Why, yes, it does. And where did it come from? The Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5. Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. That applies to traffic. Why are you laughing? Rejoice with them that do rejoice. Enter into their joy with them. Be happy for them. Not, when's God going to do it for me? Never mind you. Rejoice with them. If he did it for them, guess what? He could do it for you. Rejoice with them that do rejoice. Weep with them that weep. Have compassion. Be of the same mind one toward another. Wait a minute, Pastor. Yup. You told us we're his body. Yup. It's got many parts. Yup. It's global all around the world. Yup. How in the world can so many ethnicities, socioeconomic status, cultural backgrounds, et cetera, et cetera, possibly have one mind? Simple. Study the same book. Study the same book. You study the same book, you're going to have one mind. The Chinese underground house churches talked about, one of the brothers who wrote a book said the church there was doing great until the systematic theology book showed up. And then he started dividing. And it took them decades to get back to some unity. If you study one book. Yeah, but there are things I don't understand. Oh, good. I thought it was only me. But there are a lot of things that are very clear. So get the things that are very clear down in your life. The things you don't understand, that'll come with time. Don't worry about it. You'll be fine. Just keep putting off the old man. The rest comes easy. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Half of his audience are slaves in Rome. No rights of their own. Can be killed whenever their master wants. Treated horrifically. Tortured by their owners. Awful. Condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. God has a way of pulling that rug out from under you when you think you've got it all squared away. Recompense to no man evil for evil. How many have heard of Charles Spurgeon? Okay, he's last generation preacher. In his commentary on Psalm 7, Treasury of Scripture, David, he said, evil for good is devil-like, giving evil for good. Evil for evil is beast-like. Good for good is man-like. Good for evil is God-like. 
interesting how God works. Recompense to no man evil for evil. In other words, don't worry about payback. Provide for things honest in the sight of all men. That's again about walking in the new man. If it be possible, oh, thank goodness he said this. If it be do not os, able, or if you have strength is the idea. If it be possible, abable, or strength, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. You know, there are some people who just don't want to live peaceably. You can't be responsible for them. You can only be responsible for yourself. So as much as lies within you, if possible, live peaceably with all men. In other words, be blameless. You can't deal with them. They got to deal with themselves. As much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved. Boy, he finally got to that. Why would he start with dearly beloved? Because a tender word often helps take a tough pill. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves. That's defending your own case or maintaining your own cause. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. That's O-R-G-E. Looks like ogre to us in English. English. It's orge. It's wrath of God. So avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Hmm. Who do you think is going to do a better job of bringing retribution? You or God? Yeah, but I'm so angry. Yeah, okay, great. But who's going to do a better job of solving this? You or God? God's the one. That, by the way, coming from Deuteronomy 3235, where he warned him that he will judge. God's judgment moves slowly, but it grinds very fine when it comes. I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. How many have heard of Elisha the prophet? Okay, good. Elisha the prophet kept warning the king of Israel what the king of Syria was up to. And the king of Syria finally grabs his advisors and he goes, all right, all right, who? Who is it? They're like, what? One of you are spilling the beans on our battle plans to the king of Israel. And finally, one of the people in the cabinet there speaks up and says, it's none of us, your majesty. They got this prophet over there in Israel named Elisha, and he's so dialed into God, he hears the very words you speak in your bedchamber. Oh. He says, get him. So he sends the Syrian army in. They go to the town of Dothan where Elisha is staying. They surround the town. That morning a servant gets up, comes out, looks out, and they're completely surrounded. He runs back in panic. Yo, my, my master, my master, what are we going to do? We're surrounded. And Elisha says, Lord, open his eyes. And he sees all around that army another army of chariots of fire and the sold, you know, basically the host of the Lord. And so in other words, don't panic. We got a bigger group around them who are with us. And as they start coming in, Elisha says, Lord, strike them with blindness. And he strikes that whole army with blindness. And Elisha comes up to the guy in charge, says, hey, this isn't the town of the people you're looking for. Come with me. Takes him by the hand. They all start grabbing hands. And he leads them over to Samaria, brings them into the city walls, gets them inside, and then goes, okay, Lord, open their eyes. And their eyes open up, and they're in the inner court zone here of the city where all their enemies are ready to kill them. Open their eyes. And the king says to Elisha, do, do I kill him? Do I kill him? He says, no, feed him. So they had a barbecue. They roast and sacrifice and everything else, and they feed him, and they give him food and wine and all that, and you hang out, and now the family, and okay, you know, I've been raiding a lot, yeah, a few years, you know, having that time together, and then sent him away. And guess what they stopped doing? Raiding Israel, at least for a season. Now there's an example, if your enemy hungers, feed him might turn him into a friend. If your enemy is hungered, feed him. If he thirsts, give him drink and don't put anything in it. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Oh, that's lovely. Really? Some say it's so hard to kindle a fire. These are the commentaries. What they do, they have to, you know, write something. You, it's so hard to kindle a fire in the middle of the night. You have a problem. You, you know, like you go to your neighbor and say, can I have a few coals? And they go, sure. And so they put it in a little pan and you carry it on your head. How many of you would carry coals in a hot metal pan on your head? Well, they put a little rag or they, they little, like, little hat things. Okay, possibly. But the context really is vengeance is mine. You show them kindness and it will one day be a witness against them. 
coals of fire on their head, a judgment against them. You can go read it, study it for yourself, but I'm banking on vengeance is mine as the context, and it's only about, what, 25 words before this. For in so doing, you shall heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil. Man, it's getting to be a challenge. But overcome evil with good. In other words, make it clear you've been with Jesus. Father, we thank you for your word. We ask you to be with us. Thank you for this practical side of Romans. And Lord, I, I know that I lost some people way back at to every man is given a measure of the spirit. They're still explaining to you why they don't have a gift. And how everybody else picked up a box under the tree and there was none for them. I ask, Lord, for those who've been wondering, what is my gifting and what is my calling? Would you please, Lord, begin to lay in their heart in many ways the reason you have them here. There's no greater glory than to be used for the whole reason you gave us our talents, our gifts, our abilities, our, our, our height or our lack thereof, Lord, or whatever it may be. Each person in this room, you have allowed them to go through the things they have. You didn't cause them, but you've allowed it, Lord, for a purpose. You always will use all things together for the good, for those who love God and are called according to his purposes. And so, Lord, may your body move together as one. May the love of Jesus fill the hearts of your people. May those who are on the outside looking in see such a family they've never known before. And Lord, as the church is turning away from your word, which is making it awfully hard to be agreed on many issues, may there be a remnant who look to you, who seek to walk with you. And Lord, may they burn brightly. May they be living sacrifices. In Jesus' name, amen.